Well, hi everyone, and thank you again, as always, for coming and for inviting me here. Um, you could put up one of the images there, uh, Patrick, if you would, please. Uh, Today we're going to talk. As as I get... Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, a figure from the fourth century, from the later part of the fourth century, the three hundreds. <clears throat> uh, so far, far distant in the past from us, and yet someone who is on the calendar of all the churches. Uh, his name is Gregory. Uh, he is referred to both as Gregory of Nazianzus because that was his hometown. And he is also referred to as Gregory the Theologian because he's one of the so-called Cappadocian fathers, uh, one of the really remarkable and important contributors to making Christian doctrine, making Christian teaching and faith um, more precise uh, in the days after the Council of Nicaea. Okay. So uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So he was born in, uh, uh, in Nazianzus uh, in Southwest Cappadocia. I've been to Turkey and Cappadocia is a remarkable place. I think George has been there too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you guys yeah. see that image yet? Not yet, but okay. uh, I've got one stuck image on this screen. It's the top of my head. There, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, so, um, so Cappadocia was part of the province of what was called Asia Minor in the Roman Empire, right? Today it's Turkey, okay? Uh, and one of the features of the landscape of Cappadocia, George has seen this, I've seen this, Jeannie's seen this are these amazing uh, rock structures that stick out of the earth and that in many cases are hollowed out to be churches, monasteries, gathering places. They're all over the place there. And on the inside, many of them are covered. The walls are covered with uh, frescoes, icons. Yes. Uh, and in some cases they've been restored. Here is a, um, <clears throat> a detail of a fresco icon of Gregory the Theologian, rather striking guy in his beautiful many cross uh, chasuble. And of course, as all bishops, he is uh, holding what is the work of the bishop, which is preaching the gospel. The gospel book was right there in his hand. And the other hand is a uh, blessing. Uh, he doesn't have it raised up, but he is he's giving a blessing uh, to the people in his, in, in his diocese. Uh, Gregory was born in the in the in the uh, third century, and um, we know that in those days, uh, bishops and dioceses were nothing like they are today. The bishop was a very local pastor, so uh, his parents, Gregory the Elder, and his mother Nona, who was also a saint, you'll see an image of her later. Uh, they were wealthy landowners and farmers. Um, they were both converts because even as late as the 300s, uh, not everybody was Christian. So both of them came in adulthood into the Christian faith and were baptized as adults. Um, one of the interesting things that happened is that after he was baptized, Gregory's father discovered that he had gifts for speaking and for administration and for doing things that a pastor would and uh, was very, very quickly recognized by the bishop of the next few towns over. And uh, the people in the congregation were asked whether or not they thought Gregory the elder uh, would be a fit priest. And so he was ordained a deacon and a priest. And then as happened in those days, since his territory covered a number of smaller villages. They made him into what is called in Greek, a core episcopus, that is to say a country or rural bishop. So in those days, the rectors of larger parishes that encompassed quite a, a bit of, of, of uh, territory were, were made local bishops. Of course, then in the big city, there would be a kind of a presiding bishop, an archbishop or a metropolitan. Uh, but for most of his life, most, not all of his life, uh, our man today 
Gregory the theologian or Gregory of Nazianzus was only ever the bishop of a small town, although for a few years he was actually the bishop uh, or a patriarch of Constantinople. Um, Gregory's parents were like other wealthy people, aristocratic landowners, very much interested in promoting their kids' futures. So what they did with Gregory, who had a younger, two younger brothers, another Gregory and a guy named Caesarius, they sent uh, Gregory off to what would be the equivalent of Harvard or Yale or Stanford or Berkeley in his time. They sent him to the philosophical and rhetorical academies or universities in first in Caesarea, which was the capital city of uh, Cappadocia, and then Alexandria, the capital city of Egypt, and finally on to whether you, whether for you it's the Harvard or the Yale, the, the, the highest ranking school, which was the Academy in Athens. At this time, most of the professors, most of the key scholars were not Christians. Uh, and so it was not considered to be problematic at all for Christian students to go study with them and learn their craft. And so in fact, that's what Gregory did. He got the equivalent of a doctoral degree uh, and then he made his way home. But during his studies, um, he became friends with a classmate who was also from Cappadocia, in fact, from the capital city of Caesarea, which today is uh, Caesarea, uh, a man named Basil, who eventually is called Basil the Great. In this icon of the three great teachers of the Eastern church, we have from the left with a very long beard and a much receding hairline like some of us, uh, Basil the Great. Basil became a lifelong friend and sometimes very problematic friend of our friend St. Gregory, who we're talking about today. In the middle, uh, and he should actually be quite shorter than the other two, uh, but the iconography here has been kind to him, is John Chrysostom. Chrysostom means the, the one with the golden mouth. Um, it, uh, he was uh, a priest uh, in Antioch, a, a tremendously uh, well-liked preacher, and he was called by the emperor and the council in Constantinople uh, to become the bishop of Constantinople. That is to say, the second ranking bishop in the world. The first ranking bishop was the bishop of Rome, and the second ranking bishop was the bishop of so-called New Rome or Constantinople. Constantinople means the Emperor Constantine's city. So John Chrysostom made quite a career for himself. Uh, there is a liturgy that is thought to stem from his uh, writing. There are dozens and dozens and dozens, you can find them yourself online, sermons and commentaries of his on the Old Testament, on the New Testament, some, some particularly memorable ones. It is St. John Chrysostom, who is the one who teaches us that there is a liturgy after the liturgy. So we go from the table in, in the church where we receive the body and blood of the Lord. And the second liturgy is celebrated in the heart of the neighbor that faces us day after day. That is where we make the first liturgy uh, real, enacted in love and care for our brothers and sisters. And then the last guy here uh, is Gregory uh, of Nazianzus or Gregory the theologian. All three of these guys don't have the gospel book, but they do have their right hand raised in blessing because they're bishops. They have a special bishop's stool, uh, the white one you see with the many crosses on it that is around their shoulders and down the front. It's supposed to remind you that they are shepherds. It's supposed to remind you that a shepherd goes out and carries back the stupid lost sheep on the shepherd's shoulders. And each of them has a scroll, which is to remind you that they were all great preachers and great teachers for the whole of the church. And when I say church here, I mean the whole of the church. These three and others that we will see today uh, their feast days are on all the calendars of all the churches, Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic, Orthodox makes no difference. They're all recognized as great teachers. Their writings are still studied uh, in theological schools and in seminaries. Uh, Gregory had a, a, a rather long 
and I will have to say a very troubled career. Uh, he found himself very soon after his return to his hometown, pressured by his father to first be ordained a priest to help out his father, and then to help out his father um, combat uh, various divergent teachings around, the chief of which is the teaching of Arius or Arianism. This is a beautiful detail of an, a fresco, another fresco icon, of uh, uh, of uh, Gregory, uh, and uh, it shows you something of what has been remembered about his actual face and features. No matter what uh, icon you see of this man, or for that matter of John Chrysostom or the others, uh, there is something distinctive about the hair, about the beard, about the elongated face. Uh, that really is almost like a preserved memory of what he actually looked like. We know uh, that scholars have confirmed this by saying uh, it is a memory that was preserved by the artists who created these. Even they laid in have photographs to remember people. They would remember them by constantly coming back to the same set of features. So unlike Basil, who has a very, very long beard and a very receding hairline, uh, here, he has a much bushier beard. I always remember Gregory as the one with the bushy beard. And of course, John Chrysostom as someone who is extremely short. Um, he was just about five feet tall <laughs> and yet a powerhouse of a preacher. Okay, I said that Gregory, who we're talking about today, had a troubled life. Uh, not only did his father pressure him into ordination as a priest, he not long later on pressured him to be or consecrated or ordained as a bishop. Again, remembering that in these days, bishops for the most part were very local pastors and Gregory's father was getting older. He was finding it more and more difficult to take care of the communities that he was in charge of. It, was, it wasn't enough for him to have his son as a priest, he needed him to be a bishop too. I love this is, this is a Peter Paul Rubens much later Western painting of Gregory. And uh, what he's done here is he has turned uh, the her heresy of Arius into this monstrous creature, <laughs> which Gregory is uh, killing with his bishop's staff. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of the, uh, the sacred violence that sometimes gets into uh, sacred art. Uh, I must say a couple of words here and I'll try to be as clear as I can. What is this Arianism and, and, and why was it such a problem? This is still the ancient world. And in the ancient world, uh, people like hard edges on things. So God is God and the world is the world. And if there is one God, then there is only one God, particularly for those people who knew of or came out of the Jewish tradition who were radical monotheists. Um, interestingly enough, even among the Greco-Roman pantheons of gods, uh, there was an, a, a, a sense that all of these individual gods, Diana and Apollo and so forth, were not really the, the thing that there was a supreme God somehow overall. And in fact, they preferred the supreme God to have fewer of the human characteristics of the gods that they worshiped, like Jupiter, and as I said, Apollo, and Mer Mercury, and all the others. So uh, when it comes to Christianity, entering into this marketplace of religious beliefs, which includes uh, Zoroastrians and Jews, which includes also the Greeks and the Romans with their particular uh, traditions and cults. Um, a challenge right away comes as soon as the Christian scriptures start talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the, if you will, Orthodox or Catholic or authentic teaching is that God is one yet three and that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are, are equal partners. You've seen the famous icon of, of Andrei Rublyov, which depicts the Trinity as the three heavenly visitors, the angels who come to see Abraham and Sarah. Well, 
that was a pictorial way of trying to get across the fact that there's a family resemblance. They all look like each other. Uh, no one of them is greater than the other. Well, this didn't exactly um, hit home with some within the church. And one priest named Arius said, no, uh, really what it is is this, that the father is really the principal. He is the chief um, person in the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. The Holy Spirit is God's force. But now we have, uh, problematically, this man, this human being who was born as a child of Mary, uh, whose name is Jesus, and who we call the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ. Well, Arius said, um, he did not exist from all eternity like the Father. Rather, it, he came into being in time. And then he was taken on, begotten of the Father, and made into the Father's uh, primary mouthpiece, spokesman, messenger. And in fact, he did suffer and die and was raised. But in a way, he's less God than the Father is. So if you follow me so far, that's what Arianism is about. Now, it may not seem so attractive to us today, Although there are many people who will say, I believe in God, but Jesus is just a very great teacher. Let's leave it at that. Uh, if you want to call me a Christian, fine. If you don't, well, that's another story. And then, for example, you have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who say, oh, sure, we're Christians. And yes, we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Father is really the God principle. The Spirit is a spirit. And Jesus is, of course, a human being just like us. And in fact, we're also we're all supposed to become gods, which is not exactly a wrong uh, idea. Uh, but they today, the Mormons have what could be called the kind of Aryan uh, outlook on God. Gregory said, nope, 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 nope. Already at the Council of Nicaea, and we say this every Sunday, we make it very clear. We say we believe in God, the Father Almighty. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and so on. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and so on. But in the Nicene Creed, unlike the Apostles' Creed, there really is an effort to spell out in greater detail, which I am not going to go into today, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. That's why we say we believe in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus Christ is human, but Jesus Christ is also God, divine. And therein is the central, if you will, dogma of the faith of Christians that there was an incarnation and there remains an incarnation, that God decided to come as close as was possible to God's creation. God was going to become human and enter into space and time with us, for us, along with us. This is, by the way, the enforced um, consecration of Gregory as a bishop. Uh, on the left is his friend Basil, who also got involved in pressuring him. And on the right is uh, Gregory's father, Gregory the Elder. And then we have a bunch of uh, obedient priests and deacons holding candles over on the left. Uh, and it is the tradition, the ancient tradition, that when a bishop is consecrated, you put the book of the Gospels over their head after the bishops who are ordaining the new bishop lay their hands on the head of the bishop, then you put the gospel book open on the head of the bishop, because that is the primary task of every chief pastor or bishop, to preach the gospel and to show others how to live the gospel. Um, so back to the Arians. Um, Gregory spent the better part of his career writing sermons, writing essays and articles, trying to make clear what it was that the church taught. Um, he wow. was eventually pressured again into being called to Constantinople to become the bishop there, which means he is the second ranking bishop in the whole church in the whole world. 
Remember, this is the time before any schisms. There is only one church, east, west, north, and south, okay? As the bishop in Constantinople, he asked the emperor, this is how you call a church council. He says, uh, emperor, this is Theodosius now, I want you to call a council because we have to go back to the Nicene Creed and we have to fine tune it. And once and for all, make it clear that what Arius and Arian people are teaching is not the authentic faith of the church. And so uh, two things happen at the same time. Uh, his good friend Basil, who forced him along with his father into being a bishop, was the very first uh, preacher and theologian to concentrate his writings on the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can still get today online, and it's not that long. Uh, I won't say it's the easiest thing to read, but it is somewhat accessible. Uh, the great text of Basil the Great on the Holy Spirit, sometimes in Latin referred to as De Spiritu Sancto. Okay, what is this image? This is from the great St. Sophia Cathedral, the Sofiski Sobor in Kiev, or Kiev, if you heard it that way, uh, capital of Ukraine, now somewhat threatened by the Russians. And in this are preserved from the nine, well, yeah, the late 900s, very early 1000s, beautiful uh, fresco mosaics uh, that were made by art, artists who came to Kiev from Constantinople. You can't see it in this, but up above them is a beautiful one of the mother of God with her hands raised like this. She is praying on behalf of the church and she is an, also an image of what the church is, that is to say, people who are constantly interceding to God for the world. But here we have a collection of saints. This goes all the way around the apse behind the altar. I have also had the great privilege and gift of visiting this cathedral, uh, not once, but a couple of times. On the left, um, in dressed as a deacon, um, holding in his left hand, you can sort of make it out, a thurible uh, and dressed in the deacon stole just on the one sh shoulder there, and also carrying um, the, the treasures of the church, which of course he told the Roman emperor were the church's poor, the widows, the orphans. This is the famous St. Lawrence the deacon, who was one of the early martyrs in the church of Rome. Okay, next to him is our friend St. Basil, the classmate and lifelong friend of Gregory the theologian, long beard, Bishop Stowe, uh, Book of the Gospels, hand raised in blessing. Same in the middle for John Chrysostom. He's the guy smack in the middle uh, of these. Uh, and in fact, if your Greek is good, you can read this contractions, John uh, the, the Golden Mouth. And then comes our friend uh, Gregory of Nyssa, who I've not mentioned to simplify things. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil were brothers. And they also had a wonderful sister, great theologian named Macrina. We'll see a picture of her later. Uh, a friend of Gregory the theologian. Over way on the end uh, is our guy today, Gregory the theologian. Theologos, it says in Greek, the one a theologian is one who speaks about God. In fact, uh, another great writer says a theologian is someone who has learned how to pray. And by the way, all of us are called to be not academic theologians. Uh, you don't have to have a doctorate, but every one of us is called to speak about God to those around us. So in a sense, there is something in this man for all of us today. I want to just add to this that having been pressured by a family member, having been pressured by a good friend and classmate, and finally having been pressured by the emperor himself, Gregory grew to have a very uh, sensitive attitude toward the institutional church and to bishops of which he was one. And one of the most memorable lines in his writings is that he advises all clergy and laity to make sure that they kept their distance from bishops and if possible, keep as far away from them as possible. <laughs> uh, he, had a, he, he was dedicated as a pastor, 
though he felt that that was not really his vocation. He felt that he was really called to be a scholar and a teacher, uh, but he did the best he could when he was the bishop in uh, Sassima, as well as in his father's town and his own town of Nazianzus. Um, after many, many years of protesting, uh, he, fi he finally convinced the emperor to let him resign from being Bishop of Constantinople. But this was after, as I said, convening the Second Council of Constantinople, which gave us the creed that we say every day. Now in our prayer books and in most liturgical books, it's just referred to as the Nicene Creed because the first version uh, came from the Council of Nicaea in 325. But almost 60 years later in 381, uh, it was the Second Council of Constantinople uh, that in fact added some language, particularly about the son proceeding from the father. Um, uh, also too, I think it's important to realize that Gregory was um, not uh, afraid of taking risks. At one point in time before he was the Bishop of Constantinople and a bishop uh, out in the countryside uh, on, on, at the Easter Vigil, his church was attacked by the Arians and several of his priests and deacons and an assisting bishop were all killed. And somehow Gregory got out alive. So he was willing to put his life on the line. He came back, by the way, <laughs> he came back, by the way, the next day and the next Sunday, he was not, he was not too scared uh, uh, to just abandon the place, but it was called the Church of the Resurrection. And the last thing I want to say about him, because you know, one can only say so much in, in a half an hour or so, and I think I'm over that already, is that uh, Gregory left us an important teaching that all will be saved. He is among those early church writers who insists, and there's a big Greek word for this, uh, who insists that in the end, if Christ truly rose from the dead, and if Christ, in fact, uh, conquered evil in all respects, how could it be that God would allow millions, if not trillions of people to be forever put into hell and punished? This has been always a matter of conflict in the church. Uh, there has never been a time when this is not debated, argued, positions taken on it. Um, and it still is the case today. I got fried for writing a positive review of a great theologian, David Bentley Hart's book of two years ago called That All Shall Be Saved. Uh, Hart is one of those who is sort of returning to the early church writers, as well as to some more recent church writers and theologians to say that it is defensible. It is certainly part of the tradition of the church that in fact, all uh, are going to be saved. Okay, the picture before this we'll go back to, but this is uh, Nona. I'm sorry. Thank you, Patrick. This is a, a um, an illumination from a manuscript. And the one thing I want to point out is that Gregory, the theologian here, is seated as as he finally was able to at the end of his life, writing some of the many many commentaries and sermons and essays he did on the Trinity on Christ on the gospels for each Sunday. And what the um, illustrator has done here is he's created a backdrop, which looks like a church. And up there, you can't read it very well because it's quite small, is an icon of the resurrection. So Gregory here is not just sitting in his study, but he is also in his own church as a bishop, the church of the resurrection. What you see there up at the very top is Christ. Uh, and he is taking Adam and Eve by the hand, and he has broken open the doors of hell. Yeah, it's not going to get any better than that. This is not a, a high-res image, but it's Jesus uh, and the harrowing of hell. We also call it that. And then the next image uh, is uh, the mother of, uh, uh, of St. Uh, Gregory, Nona. Uh, nowadays, she has been rediscovered as a, an important woman figure. Remember, in these days, bishops were married. Uh, Gregory, the theologian who we spoke of today, is the son of a bishop, and this is the bishop's wife, Nona. Um, Gregory of Nyssa was much beloved of, of his uh, wife. Uh, he was a mystic and a poet. Uh, Basil the Great, 
decided not to marry, but it would be rare to find a bishop or a priest or a deacon who was not married in the early centuries of the church. Only later on was celibacy imposed and for reasons that have uh, no, no important theology involved in them. And I think there's one more here, isn't there, uh, Patrick? Yeah, this is, a, this is kind of a, a partial family portrait. So reading left to right, once again, we have the very long bearded Basil. And then if we're gonna, I would ask us to just go to the next one. The very next one standing to him is his brother, Gregory of Nyssa. And then there is Gregory the theologian or Gregory of Nyssa, who we've been talking about today. And way over on the end is Macrina, who is the sister of Basil and Gregory and who they acknowledge to be their equal, if not their superior in her theological study and writing. In fact, all three of these, Basil and the two Gregories wrote special sermons when Macrina died. She died young and they were heartbroken and all of them participated in her funeral uh, services. We don't know if all of them preached on that occasion, but every one of them wrote a beautiful tribute almost the eulogy to her. So I wanna thank you for listening. And um, I, I, I suppose I could try to apologize for there being so much theology. By the way, let me just say one thing about this. I love, I love this last picture by Velazquez. He uh, puts Basil and Gregory together with a whole host of important Western saints. Uh, Velazquez of course was living as we do in a divided church. Um, but I think that this is a little ecumenical gesture that this great Spanish artist makes. So the bishop to the left is Basil, and smack in the middle is Gregory, right? Our, our Gregory that we taught of today. But behind them, starting behind them from the left, way over in the left-hand corner is Francis of Assisi, okay? And then there is Benedict. And then there is uh, Peter the Martyr, a famous Dominican uh, theologian and martyr. And then the guy with his hood on, which is Bruno, uh, 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 the Carthusian, the head of the Carthusian order, and smack below him with a, a black mantle and a white underneath and a, a book and a pen is the great Thomas Aquinas uh, with his Summa of Theology. And then over to the left in the other corner in the white habit is Norbert, who is the founder of an order uh, the, of canons regular who still exist today. So the Dominicans still exist, the Franciscans still exist, the uh, um, um, Norbertines still exist. And it is also possible that the guy up between Gregory and Bruno is in fact, um, you know, not Peter, uh, but also uh, uh, a Carmelite. So anyway, I wanted to show you that one because this is a little ecumenical gesture. The angels and the Holy Spirit uh, hover over these two great writers from the early church, these two Cappadocian fathers, but then also gathered around them are some of the great lights of the West. And so this is a testament to the fact that in God's eyes, there's only one church. Amen. Thank you. Why are you laughing, George? That's called a whirlwind tour. That is a, that was that was a whirlwind tour. There's no doubt about it. That was that was like hang hang on, we're going on a ride here. Yep. <laughs> yep. We're all flying together. But like, I don't uh, see I don't, I don't see anybody, Harry Potter. I don't see anybody sleeping here, so that's good. <laughs> um, I, I, I found it interesting that both the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople were called by the um, emperor of Eastern of the Eastern Roman Empire, yeah. um, and essentially, essentially were organized by the Eastern branch of the church instead of the church in Rome. And yep. Um, it, yep. Well, the interesting thing is, is that in some respects, um, at the period of time, the fourth century, in which this stuff was taking place the challenges of Arianism, the formulation of a creed. Also, by the way, the First Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, is the one that established how 
do we determine the date for Easter, okay? Uh, at this period of time, New Rome was in effect more the administrative center of not only the empire, but the church. Uh, Rome had already been, you know, the empire in a certain sense had declined there. Uh, some people say quite incorrectly that this is the beginning of the so-called dark ages. There were no such dark, dark ages. I heard this in a lecture that I had to listen to online in order to get licensed. I heard the lecturer talk about the dark ages and I moaned and Ginny said, what's the matter? I said, historians <laughs> for the last century or more have said, don't talk about the dark ages. There were no dark ages. What was happening in the West is that Rome was being en encroached upon by all of its former colonial <laughs> colonials. So people who are coming from the north, the, we used to call these people barbarians, uh, but they were all coming from Gaul or, or, or France, coming from what is today Germany, coming from what is today Scandinavia, some coming even as far as what today is the UK, the, uh, the Saxons and the Angles. Uh, they were all, you know, they knew where the money was, and that was Rome, and they were all descending upon it. And the Roman Empire was in tatters. The, the administrative and political, economic and social uh, structures of, of the empire in Rome had fallen to pieces. This is, this is why, for example, down in North Africa, in what is today Algeria, St. Augustine, the great St. Augustine, would write the city, um, the city of God, because Rome was, was, in fact, Rome eventually fell. So for the church to do anything purposeful, like convene a council, you had to have an emperor do that. It used to be that the emperor in Rome, you remember the empire was divided at one point by Constantine, that would be the emperor in Rome. But now it was you know, more possible uh, because of the uh, structures in place and the, the stability of the, of the emperor empire in Constantinople to have the emperor there convene these councils. Very interesting about church and state. At this point in time, the legacy of Constantine is, is that what works for the state uh, is that we have a church that becomes the church of all people, even if we have to force them into it. Not a good thing, not a good thing. Um, it, it, but, it, but that is the Constantinian legacy that somehow church and state will operate together. So in fact, this is the beginning of what later on we will find in most European countries that there is a state church. So for example, still today uh, in England, the Church of England is the established church, at least in Great Britain, at least in England. However, now in Wales, there is they have their own church, a church in Wales, an Anglican church. There is an Anglican church or Episcopal church in Scotland, along with the Kirk of Scotland, which is a Calvinist or Presbyterian church. And of course, over the years, over there, they've had to allow all the nonconformists, that is the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Quakers and the Catholics and the Orthodox and everybody else, the Baptists, uh, to have religious freedom. And uh, where I lived for a couple of years doing research in Denmark, uh, the Lutheran church there is still Folkekirchen. It is still the church of the people. It is still the established church, as is the case in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland. Okay. And it used to be the case uh, from one uh, region of Germany to the other, that curius regio eis religio, whoever was the prince his church would be the state church. And so, for example, most of them were Lutheran, but here and there, there was a reformed one. And there was even in Bavaria, the Catholic church. And so that's a legacy that the, uh, the founders of America wanted to distance themselves from. Hence, from the start, uh, there will be freedom of religion for everyone. There will be no state church. Ha ha. In the, colonies, <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. in the colonies, the Church of England, you whether you belong to it or not, you pay taxes to it. And up where I've lived in the Northeast, as Carrie knows, being a, an East Coaster, 
the uh, the Puritans church, the Congregational church, what today is left as the UCC, same kind of thing. It didn't make any difference if you were an Anglican or a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim, you paid taxes to the support of the state church. And this is why in um, the 1780s, a Baptist who lived just a few miles from where we are in Dutchess County in New York, over in Danbury, Connecticut, wrote a famous letter. His name was Isaac Bacchus to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and the response was the famous, there shall be a wall of separation between church and state. So that was one of the first, uh, you know, uh, refinements of what was going to be the, the policy of this new republic. They already had said in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution that there would be no tests for uh, one's religion when it came to running for office or election or anything else. But then finally responding to Isaac Bacchus, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, there should be something like a wall between the state and all the other religious communities. They should all be free. They should all be able to function. There should be no persecution of them. They should not persecute each other either, <laughs> like back home in, in Europe uh, and so forth. So that actually plays into all of this when it comes to talking about councils uh, and the church. Uh, the church that we know is very different from the church of the first 500 or even 1,000 years. It's very, very different. It's interesting. Have, uh, Go ahead, Shirley. I have a, a question. The Arians that you speak of of Gregory's time was what, 16th century? Oh, no, this is the, the, the 300th. Fourth, okay. Fourth, fourth century. Fourth but, century. But that particular word has nothing to do with what Hitler and his people called themselves no, it's, Arians. It, it sounds the same, but actually, the, the Hitler version of it was A R Y A N. Which, ah, okay. which, which, which meant the a race, a particular race right. that was superior. And of course, this is all nonsense. This is all, as they would say in Great Britain, bullocks or bullshit. Yeah. There is no such thing. But, but they were using, sad to say, the Nazis, bad anthropology from Columbia University, Franz Boas and others in America, because uh, there were people who thought that they could identify specific races with uh, uh, the distance between the eyes and how big the nose was, how big the ears were, how elongated the face was. And on the basis of these, you could identify not only different races, but different types of criminals. So there was a lot of quackery passing off as science um, in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. And because of their own motivation, the Nazi party, this played right into what they wanted. They wanted a master race. They wanted uh, as fascists to be able to decide who was not worthy of living. And that's what they did with the Jews and the gypsies, right. with the gays, with the, uh, with the Mormons, with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if with given them. enough time, I was told this at Auschwitz, all of the Slavs, and most religious people would have been turned into first slaves and then exterminated. So only one race, uh, you know, whose church had completely given itself over to Hitler would endure. I mean, they, they were, when you, when you think of what their actual plans were, it's not just monstrous, it's insane. It's but, terrible, you know, but, but we're also they, were also, this, yeah. they were also assassinating uh, incapacitated people. That's right. People who Any, are sick in any way. Anybody who was challenged, uh, anybody who was chronically ill, uh, children who had epilepsy, children who were autistic. Yeah. 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 Well, I think, uh, Michael, you could also make a good case for the uh, Episcopal Church trying to seize the high ground, which they literally did in Washington, D.C. Oh, yes. And build, and build a cathedral as high as any other building in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., and they call it the church for all people. Yeah. And any state, any large state funeral, uh, federal funeral, yeah. uh, happens there. Yep. It's, uh, it's quite it's amazing. Yeah, and the, the pageantry is unbelievable. It looks like I was in Rome 
And I happened to be in uh, St. Peter and Paul with pushing my granddaughter, a little, she was one at the time, a little stroller. Whoa, mm -hmm. in come all the cardinals. Yeah. Uh, this parade yeah. coming down. I mean, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous, red mm -hmm. and white yeah. and, yeah. you know, the whole nine yards. And then fast forward, I'm in the uh, National Cathedral doing my little serving part in my white outfit. And um, in come all the bishops with yeah. their hats and their oh, yeah. finery and their, oh my oh, Lord, yeah. the procession goes on and I, on and on. I love the National Cathedral. When I was a university student in DC, at least once, if not twice a month, some of us would be up there on Sunday afternoon for evening prayer because the music was gorgeous. The place oh. was gorgeous. And yes, I mean, the same is true in New York City. Uh, it, 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 they never finished the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, which at one time was the largest church in the world. It's not anymore. Uh, but it, too, is up there on Morningside Heights. It overlooks. I mean, if you if you somehow get up a little bit higher in the structure, you can look down on the rest of the island of Manhattan. So, again, Either, either you hand it to the Episcopalians or you wince at this, but they had a sense that they were the church here in the United States. And to some extent, if you total up the number of colonies and you total up you know, the number of groups that came to this country, uh, there were of course Lutherans from Sweden and other places. There were German Lutherans, there were Quakers. Um, obviously there were Catholics too. But probably if you went by the number of the colonies and then how many colonies was the Anglican church, the state church, they, they were on top of the heap. So they, even, even when that was over, even when that was over, uh, they, they still said, well, we're, that's our legacy. You know, we were the lead church here. And the good side of it is, is that in the last, I would say, 100 years or, or more, they have tried to be on the forefront of social justice They've been on the forefront of, of the rights of all people. Uh, so there's a lot to be said on behalf of that. And I think ecumenically that is recognized, you know. Yeah, but, uh, I, I would like to confirm that. <laughs> they may be Epis built by Episcopalians, but Jews, Quakers, whatever, can preach on that pulpit. That's right. And St. John's in New York has done an amazing job in that Morningside neighborhood to oh, include people that live there and some of the construction training them, yep. these stone masons and so forth. They gave the property across the street to build an assisted right. living. And that was right. my old neighborhood for five years. Uh -huh. So Jeannie and I would bounce back and forth between the high church at St. John the Divine and Bill Coffin, William Sloan Coffin, over at the Riverside Church, he was he was tearing it up over there. So we li we lived there in a charmed period of time. But James Morton, who just died this past year, was the dean of the cathedral, and the really charismatic Paul Moore was the bishop of New York in right. the time that I was there. So and I was there, and I took part in the very first Lutheran uh, Episcopal celebration of the Eucharist at St. John the Divine. I mean, I've tried to put this into my ecumenical creds uh, in this process that I'm in, but so far I haven't had anybody re really interested in it, but I was there for it. I mean, there were there was quite a turnout of clergy and bishops galore. I mean, there were three, three Lutheran bishops and six Episcopal bishops, so, you know. It was I'm going to have to leave you someone's here for their coupons. Bye. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Glad you could join us. I, I want to go. I want to go back to Gregory, Constantine, and Theodosius because it fascinates me on two levels. One that the center of administration, not just for the Roman Empire but for the Church, was out of Constantinople or Byzantium, and two that prior to that the Roman emperors were largely willing to allow people to worship however they wanted, and they didn't really need the unity of a state church. And it seems that that's kind of the beginning of church and state being tied together in lockstep and going forward for about the next 1300, 
1500 years mm -hmm. until until we start to get the div division again of, of separation of church and state and yeah. is, is that accurate yes it's absolutely accurate i mean you can even pull back a little further to the 16th century the time of the reformation the various reformations the lutheran the english reformation <laughs> Uh, the Genevan or Calvinist Reformation that shaped Scotland. And then even a little bit later, <clears throat> and important to honor George's uh, legacy here, the important recognition of a priest of the Church of England who tried to stay in the Church of England, but uh, who found that there was no place for him. That's John Wesley and his brother Charles. Charles stayed in the church, but eventually John started ordaining uh, priests because none of the bishops would ordain priest room. Now, when did that also happen? It also happened with respect to the colonies in the United States. Finally, Samuel Seabury, who is a very interesting, colorful character from Connecticut, had to go to, to Edinburgh and be ordained by the Episcopal Scottish Church because the Bishop of Rome wouldn't ordain him the Archbishop of Canterbury wouldn't have anything to do with them. Why? Because they didn't want a bishop over here. They wanted to be able to control the Anglican Church here from England. And so the uh, American Episcopalians, not all of them, most of them. And interestingly enough, the most of them were not in the South. The Southern Anglicans wanted to stay. They were Tories. They wanted to stay under the crown. So Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, they would be the major ones there. They were very low church, very, they were also somewhat anti-clerical. They did not want a bishop in America, but all the other colonies, and there are quite a few of them going north, said, no, if we're going to be a real church, we have to have our own bishop. And so in a certain sense, it was a kind of a religious revolution, just as the political one that was going on. So they send this guy, Samuel Seabury, who himself was a Tory. He was a crown sympathizer, but they sent him successfully. The Scottish bishops, of course, since they could thumb their noses at the, the brethren down south, uh, consecrated him and sent him back over here. And then the rest is history. Um, <clears throat> eventually, you know, you have to have two bishops to consecrate. So they got another guy who ordained eventually, William White. And then, see, I actually know something about Anglican history, Patrick. Uh, I, I know you do, Michael. I'm, I I'm, I'm not the one who doubts that. I know, I know, I know. That's, that's an inside joke. But, 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 it, but it's, inter it's interesting because essentially um, the, marriage of church, the marriage of church and state seems to have started out in Byzantium and grown stronger and stronger. And you mentioned the 1600s with yeah. the Reformation period. Yeah. But even, even throughout the Reformation, church and state were heavily tied together. Absolutely. And if you, were in the church, Absolutely. if you were in the church that was not the state, then you were going to be persecuted. Yeah. Um, and, and that's probably until sometime with the United States experiment, experiment. And then the Episcopal Church basically exists because you have to separate once your state has separated from the state that your church pledges allegiance to, you have to separate it as a church because yeah. you can't have bishops pledging their allegiance to the King of England right. if they're going to be Americans. That's right. Um, that's, why, that's why they had to produce a new prayer book, mostly because in the prayer book, it, it ordered you to pray for the king. And he was not going to be, he was not the king anymore, right? Interesting. I mean, even when Wesley came here, um, along with Asbury and others, they continued to use the, the Book of Common Prayer. And while they were here, it was still colonies, they continued to pray for the king. I mean, what else could they do? That was the only way to do it. But I want to point out that in our time, I don't think I really need to remind you of this, that we have seen a new kind of fusion of politics and religion. And I don't mean those of us who may be more progressive on the left, but I mean the Christian nationalists. I mean the people who carried a cross into the insurrection on January 6th of last year. I mean, the ones who are down on their knees begging Jesus to show himself again, come again and make Trump not only the president, but perhaps even our king. 
I mean, you think I'm crazy? No, among some, not all, evangelicals, there now is a belief that in order to protect Christianity, to protect white people, and to protect the arrangements that we've had all through our history, many of which are racist, uh, we, we now have to once again fuse church and state. And there are plenty of guys, uh, bloggers mm. and other media, uh, media celebrities who, who like uh, Glenn Beck is a good example of this, uh, who's always been pushing the fact that real Christians are right wingers, real Christians, uh, you know, do not want any change in this country. Real Christians want government to be shrunk down till it's almost nothing and taxes cut and cut and everybody's left on, on to their own devices because that's the way God does it. God gives us all, you know, the ability to fend for ourselves. Why should the state be interfering? In fact, that's idolatry. So social security, Medicare, Medicaid, any of the other programs is all idolatry. It's taking the place of God. And so what, other... what happens in their argument um, when they try to make uh, Trump king? Is that not idolatry? Of course it is. Of course it is. But what they do is they invoke selectively uh, the Old Testament, where you know uh, God sends a prophet to pick out first Saul and then David. I mean, still at the coronations in Westminster Abbey, you know, in the middle of, of, of the of one of the great anthems that they sing, you know, Zadok the priest, they break out Vivat Rex or Vivat Regina, long live the king, long live the queen. Because in fact, in the, in the um, I think it's in second, first Samuel, where this takes place, the people, after he pours the oil over Saul's head, break out and say, God save the king, uh, may the king live forever. And that's sung, uh, it's a Handel anthem, Alleluia, 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 Amen. You know, this is a- of, of, course, of course, up until relatively modern times, the king was viewed as God's anointed one. Right. And Charles the first, Charles the first rather famously said, and it eventually ended up costing him his life, Yep. Uh, at the head of an axeman that a prince needs an need answer to no one but God. That's right. Um, and the divine and right so, of kings. Yeah, the divine right of so, kings. So, I mean, it, so the divine right of kings is ultimately where, not that I ascribe to it, but if you are an evangelical and you think that Trump is the chosen one, then you think he would be divinely appointed. And, and for you, at least, it's not illogical. It's well, illogical he, to me. <laughs> he himself claimed, and you all heard it, that he has supreme power. There is nothing that he cannot do as president. That was his own view of the office. You couldn't be any more wrong than that, because the president is not a monarch. The president has to be has to work within the confines of the Constitution and the two other branches of government. But we, we had somebody who was not in his own right mind, uh, but who had delusions of grandeur and who said, uh, I can do anything. I can, the, the Constitution gives me the right as the president to do anything that I think is, uh, I need to do or that I want to do. I mean, that's insane. All right. I don't mean yeah, to I, turn this into I, politics, but, but where does this come from? It does come from the fact that if the king is anointed by God and rules by divine right, not just by election or acclamation, uh, then the king can do anything. And there's nothing that the king does that uh, can be called into question because the king and God are on the same wavelength, you know. Uh, Michael? Going back to... When I, when I was in prison ministry, uh, I was standing with a... a African-American woman, evangelical, and she, most of, most of the people that were serving in this ministry were African-Americans, and she turned to me, and I never expected this question, and she said, when were you saved? I yeah. was absolutely thrown a curve that I didn't know what to do with, mm -hmm. and out of my mouth came, 
I think that because I knew she was talking about Jesus, I said, well, I deal more in the Holy Spirit. But if you <laughs> think about um, Jesus saving, I think Jesus saved me from idolatry. Because you keep going back to the Sermon on the Mount and to the Old Testament, and there is every reason to be suspicious of kings or anything like that from Samuel on, um, yeah. right? So we yeah. forget our we forget our roots in these conversations. We don't. We we need to go back farther because we are warned about um, well, th wanting a, a king. There is. A, I I think you've heard me talk about this. There is the wonderful experience I had three or four years ago at a family wedding when one of my nieces, who is a, a very, uh, very devout evangelical in Phoenix, came up to me. I had my collar on and came up to me at the wedding because she was sent by Jeannie, I believe, uh, and said, uh, Uncle Michael, when did you become a Christian? And so I said, well, it was on a day in May of 1948. And I thought her eyes were going to fall out of her head. Uh -huh. uh, and she said, that's not possible. She said, you would only be a month old. I said, no, that's when I became a Christian. And I said, I'll go one further. That's when I was saved, although that's not the way we talk about it. But she comes from a tradition in which two things happen. You make a confession of faith in Jesus as your personal savior. And thereupon you are baptized, but you can only be baptized if you make an action of faith. And I said to her, Rachel, I said, the majority of people in this world who acknowledge Jesus as Lord have been baptized like me when they were little, when they could not possibly make a confession of faith. Well, she said, the ancient church. I said, yes, but in the ancient church, the whole family was baptized. Not just the people who could say, credo in unum deum, I believe in one God, but those who could go, wah, you know, and only and, wah. And they the got, slaves. They, right, and the slaves. They, they all got <laughs> dipped, if you will. They all got baptized too. So, you know, you can't make the argument that the Baptists and other evangelicals have made now for centuries that only people who are rationally capable of saying that they believe in Christ. What about the people who can't? What about the people who through some kind of physical or emotional disability cannot say those words? They cannot be part of the Christian community. I mean, today we don't say saved so much. We say, we say that we have become part of the family or the household of God. We have become body of Christ. the body of Christ. We have become the body of Christ. And this, <laughs> by the way, is how it is portrayed in the scriptures Paul never talks about anything other than going down into the font and dying with Christ and coming up and being ra raised by Christ and that we become part of the body. Christ is the head. Yeah. Well, I, I know we've, we're, we're getting near the end, but I, I want to go back to the inter <laughs> intertwining of uh, church and state. And we, we've been talking about the state encroaching on religion yeah. and taking over but it also works the other way and in your example that gregory's father and mother were obviously married and were bishops to points up marriage most priests were married then right and in fact most priests were married up until basically pope leo the ninth right um and when and we when leo the ninth for political reasons apparently for bad William the Conqueror to marry Matilda because of the yeah. alliance that it would form is when the church essentially got intertwined into marriage and mm -hmm. marriage became a sacrament, at least in the Roman Catholic Church. It's not in every other church. Right. But then that brings us forward into the current day where we have the Obergefell decision. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is, mar is marriage a civil thing or is it a religious thing? At least for the first thousand years of the church, it was not a religious thing. Right. And the, and the trouble is, is that going forward, it, it could be possible for a Supreme Court to strike that down and not to respect its precedent. And that Obergefell decision is the, the legality and the protection of marriage between same-sex people. 
that had to be argued and that had to be won in order for there to be federal protection, right? There, before that, there was no such thing. And there were people on the court at the time, Scalia, in fact, one of them, who said, no, there is no constant, because it's not there in the documents from the late 1700s, because there's no line that we can find or that we can unpack as protecting it, they're originalists. Therefore, we, we can't deal with any situation that is new or that is different. And that, that's a, that is a death sentence for law as a living tradition. So what's interesting is, is that the things that we think of as only relics of the past, controversies of the past, problems of the past, uh, historians will tell you have a way of reasserting themselves in different clothing and under different uh, circumstances, even in our own time. And so the intertwining of politics and religion is never going to go away. Of course, it was inevitable that that would happen. Uh, even in the gospels, we find Jesus saying, well, who's on this coin? Hey. Caesar, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, pay to Caesar what is Caesar's, the taxes, and to God what is God's. Right? Paul says, who do you pray for? Of course you, of course you pay, pray for the rulers, but you also are not bound to follow them when they're breaking God's law. So, you know. Upper but if you're a king, it's much better to claim a divine right. Right. George. Just a quick question. Uh, St. Paul's Chapel, was that a Episcopalian in New York? Yes. Where, uh, where yes. George Washington worshipped? Yes, it was. It was. Uh, it was part of Trinity. It was part of the Trinity, part of Trinity Church. Church. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's where he was inaugurated. That's where he went for prayers, and then he went over to Federal Hall, which is still standing there. And as you all know, on 9/11, that is where they brought many of the not only the survivors but the dead. Uh, the Franciscan friar priest, Father Michael Judge, they carried his body into St. Paul's Church and then took it from there to the morgue. He was a, a fire department chaplain and uh, was killed when the second tower came down. I, and, I worked at St. Paul's Chapel uh, after 9-11. I was there yeah. for a month. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, Father Linden, can't think of his last name now, uh, ended up with alcoholism. Yeah. And it has now, has since recovered. Oh, good. But good. Uh, yeah. This has been an amazing conversation. Can can we um, be prayed out? Yes. Do yes. we have a fighting chance? <laughs> Would you like to pray us out, Carrie? Oh, Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We pray you graciously to allow us to ha have had our hearts open to your word and the historical presence and deep knowledge of our teacher today. Uh, we call him Rabbi Michael. We pray for all of us. We pray for the future of our planet. In your name. Amen. 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 Well, thank Remember, you. Remember next week we switch to Tuesday. Next week we switch to Tuesday. And I can tell you ahead of time, since there is a, an important feast, the one that ends the Christmas uh, cycle, uh, the Feast of the Presentation or Candlemas on uh, the 2nd of February, we will be talking about that little scene in Luke's Gospel where uh, he is brought as a, a, a relatively young child, eight days old, to the temple, not only to be named, but also to be dedicated to God. And this is, uh, is a beautiful coming together of the Old Covenant and the New, and, and one more of the revelations or epiphanies of who Jesus is in this time of epiphany. So that's what we'll talk about next week.